tonight's uh, discussion will be on memories of the Wolf Lake watershed. And um, it actually comprises chapter four in my uh, uh, 15 year history. Um, and it was collected initially, um, it, well, if those who have attended festivals in the past know that usually, usually we have uh, one or two sessions on history, Wolf Lake history, Kaiman history, um, through the years, and that for, for more than a decade. And um, one year, I think it was probably about 2008, I thought, hey, it's a good idea if we could just get people to sit around and talk about their memories of Wolf Lake. Um, so we did that. I think it must have been at a winter festival. Well, the following year, I was pushed into this project of writing a history of the watershed. And then I thought back and I thought, well, wait a minute, we had this discussion and no, you know, nobody took notes. Oh, so in January of 2010, I set aside a session, and Ollie went out and purchased a, a recorder, audio recorder, and um, we sat down at the Environmental Education Center, and I recorded everything. So, um, so the the book of, of the, the chapter four contents of chapter four is uh, partially uh, due to that uh, session we had in January of 2010. Uh, but even before we had that session, I would I started distributing, uh, sending out invitations of people to uh, contribute. Uh, their memories, and I started clipping things from newspapers that uh, were of memories of the watershed. And then over time, uh, I, I collected, uh, this is about 16 pages, and um, I'm still collecting. And uh, if the manuscript is ever published, um, I promise these people that their names will be in, in, the, in the book. So it's an easy way to get yourself in a book. Uh, but it's, it's also surprising the number of people that say, oh yeah, 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 and then I never hear from them. Uh, but that's all right, too. Um, so that is kind of how the collection started of these memories. And it was um, aided. In fact, that session we had, it was recorded, was transcribed by a AmeriCorps volunteer, a name of Casey Fletcher, and um, the um, effort was also uh, supported by Evelyn Heesaker, uh, who would go to meetings and uh, distribute the uh, brochures that I, the invitations uh, for people to uh, record their memories, and so that uh, produced some. And then um, over time, I guess if you keep looking for something, you'll, uh, you'll end up with, uh, with a pretty good section. Um, I wanted to start by uh, just going through a selection of those from, uh, from chapter four. The collected memories suggest that the Wolf Lake watershed was more central to the lives of local residents in decades past than it is today. And I think we know that because when the federal government started giving money to uh, promote leave no child inside, um, that there was a big effort to get people back outside. Um, but in those days, uh, it was a kid's paradise, whether it was Forsyth Park, a 
Mesal Channel, um, Roby or George Lake in Hammond or Eggers Grove or the Avenue K Channel in Chicago. Arizona would be approximately that part of the Hegwish community east of Avenue O. And if Cynthia were here, she could explain even uh, better than that. Um, these were and remain blue collar communities where, for the most part, family vacations remain local. Several in entries date to the 1920s and the Great Depression. But a majority of recollection, recollections were from the 1950s and 1960s. For those who remained in the community after leaving school, there are some whose memories extend their full life from childhood to approaching retirement years. Although it was a kid's paradise, the watershed was more. During winter, it provided transportation for some families following Sunday church who would walk across the lake to visit relatives who lived on the other side. Others would ski across. And before the dredging in the late 1950s, one could walk across the entire lake in summer, too. In the 1890s, the depth of the lake averaged about two and a half feet, and the deepest areas about three and a half. And how do I know this? Because in 1895, the federal government came in to, uh, to determine if Wolf Lake would be a good harbor. And so uh, they did all the surveys, and they brought in the information, and um, and that's how they, uh, they and they recorded this information. After the dredging, the average depth became increased to eight and a half feet, with the deepest areas at a depth of 16 feet, and some will, will swear that it's much deeper. Uh, there are some holes in the lake much deeper than 16 feet. Uh, but whatever, um, it's, uh, the lake is much deeper than it was uh, before the dredging. And that caused subsequent misadventures of all kinds and in all seasons. The watershed promoted by state commerce among squatters and neighbors to the watershed. Some rented boats and provided other services. There was the Delaware House in Hagwish. As, uh, as described in uh, previous uh, chapters in the book. There was the Wolf Lake Speedway, the Roby Racetrack, the Nike Base, Thurl and Duffield Firecracker Plant, built near the remnants of an ice mining building and piers, and the sign along Indiana Tollway that warned against, against depositing radioactive material into Wolf Lake without a special permit. <laughs> and there's a page and a half description of that, by the way, by uh, Lee Botts, who was one of our speakers last year, last January. And it's, a great, it's just a great story. Those places are gone, but a few remain, like the veterans markers, an obelisk that marked the 1946 creation of William Power State Fish and Wildlife Area, although it wasn't called that at the time. I think it was called Wolf Lake Park. Hunting was banned in the mid-1970s in the Indiana portion of the watershed. It continues at William Powers. Swimming was banned in the Illinois portion of the watershed in the 1960s, but it is still allowed in Indiana. However, today swimmers prefer the Lake Michigan shoreline over Wolf Lake Park's beach area. And there were dreams of other institutions that remained unfulfilled, such as the case of Frank Lloyd Wright's amusement park and visions of profitable resorts that would dot the eastern shoreline of Wolf Lake. Fishing and trapping were first, which first lured Native Americans and European fur traders to the area also occupied male youth during the mid-20th century 
as with the early visitors, it was the money maker for boys during the 1940s through 1970s. It would sell fish, turtles, and fur skins for spending money and provide ducks for the dinner table. Before school, it was duck hunting and time to check the traps. Quote, four or five in the morning, I would check them. Ed Smutniat talks about trapping muskrats. Lots of people would steal your traps, but I took theirs too. We'd shoot 15 American coots. My mom would cook them. George Lake was like a war zone for hunting. Uh, I think some of you probably know Ed Smutniak, uh, those from Whiting anyway. Frank Porosky remembers spearing big carp and sounding them, them to other fishermen. They had them little bluegills, and I had a little wagon with burlap and had about 20 big carp in there, a puck apiece. Bob Brandeis recalls that his father was a muskrat trapper and that he and his brother Tony would trap all winter and take the pelts to Chicago's Maxwell Street and they would barter them away. And that was a huge amount of money back in the Great Depression. During Christmas vacation, it was ice skating and ice hockey for Joe Kruschek and playing tag to the numerous cattail slash muskrat houses in the marsh. We used to swim in the Avenue K Channel, recalls Jerry Kuzniar, right by Boy Scout Road. One of the guys stove down and felt something metallic. It was a car, and we were trying to figure out how would a car get in the middle of the water, and of the water like that. But then we kind of unraveled the mystery. We had heard reports of guys driving their cars on the ice in winter, especially if you were ice fishing. Uh, that was uh, not uncommon. For girls, it was a different adventure. Kay Grigorovich Rosinski recalls hiking with her older sister and neighborhood friends from Robertsdale to Eggers Grove, where they would make a fire and roast potatoes. On the way, we'd get to pet the horses at the stable off of 112th Street and feed them with carrots and apples. Since I grew up practically next door to Wolf Lake, we calls Betty uh, DeLink, <coughs> who, by the way, teaches art here at Kinda College. It became the source of exploration, swimming, fishing, playing, and wonderment for little girls. Some of my favorite pets were turtles, frogs, and salamanders. What a wonder to find a monarch chrysalis on a milkweed, take it home and wait for it to hatch. We would let the newly hatched butterfly walk on our hands and feel his tickly tongue eating the sugar we had placed there. Perry Recker asked his mother about her memories. She grew up in North Hammond. In grade school in the late 1930s, she would go fishing with her brother whenever he would return home from college. As mom recalls, first they would sing for minnows to use for bait, then fish with a bamboo pole or one of Grandpa Johnson's rods and reels. She remembers areas with big fat cattails. They usually call crap crappie or other panfish. <clears throat> After their years in school, those who remained in the area continued to hunt and fish. I remember I was working at Republic Still, recalls uh, Perosco. My buddies would go to Lost Marsh hunting, and I'm booting up ready to go, and my dad says, don't go. The cops got your brother and his friend. So they arrested everyone, and my dad had to vouch for everybody to get the guns. It was about 76, 77, 77 and they quit the hunting. Seventy years ago, Ed Smutniak was making a living trapping muskrats. I made more money than working. It's different now. Everything's filled in. He's, he's talking about the, the, uh, all the water. Uh, fishing with family was different. When the sun would warm you through and through, reflects Patty Fisher, 
In the quiet of the day, with the singing of the birds nearby, our only distractions, we would feel a tug on our lines, hoping we had the biggest catch ever caught at the lake and enjoying the thrill of the catch. There with your family, getting accolades for our accomplishments. How could you feel any happier? Trips to Wolf Lake gave kids a chance to explore wildlife that existed under rocks and logs. My father worked for Inland Still and big family vacations were not part of the picture for our family. We call us Bob Victor. After returning home after his midnight shift, his father would take the family to Wolf Lake where we would have a breakfast of spam and eggs and do a little fishing. Priceless family vacations all at Wolf Lake. Misadventures. Wolf Lake was dredged in the 1950s of sand to build dikes to transport workers and supplies for the construction of the Indiana Tollway. Consequences followed. In 1964 or 1965, when I was 14 or 15, and my brother Michael was seven or eight, writes Christine Zufleta, Zufleta Racker. I took him ice skating to Wolf Lake. I found a typo. Uh, we skated happily for some time, with me noticing in particular the teenage boys playing ice hockey nearby. Being a curious boy, Michael went over to see the hole where I told him men had been fishing, and he fell in. The water was about 20 feet deep, and he was below the ice, bobbing up and down. I had the presence of mind to know that if I tried to pull him out, I could fall in too. In a moment of clarity, often associated with emergencies, I realized the hockey players could stand on more solid ice and extend their sticks for Michael to grab onto and pull himself out. I rushed over to ask for help. They did help, and Michael was safe. It was the coldest day of a very cold winter, and we couldn't even tie Michael's shoelaces because they'd frozen together. As we walked a few blocks back to our home on Avenue N in Hagwish, I kept telling Michael, walk faster, and he kept replying, I'm trying, and I kept answering, I know. When we got home, our parents were overwhelmingly relieved. Michael was given a warm bath and emerged from this would-be tragedy with only some frostbite to his ears. I was emotionally shaken for some time. Our parents contacted the teens to express their thanks with pizza and ten dollars each. I remember the bones of this story this way for many years. Only recently did I learn a few extra details from Michael. Most significantly, significantly that there was a brief period of time when this episode got much worse for him. My haste to skate over and get the hockey players, I neglected to tell Michael where I was going. He thought I was abandoning him. And yeah, that isn't that great. <laughs> great story. Uh, Marilyn Rousseau writes, Wolf Lake on the Illinois side has always been part of my memories of growing up. It was and still is walking distance from my home. My parents would fish and have picnics there. Often my father would take my cousin and me for walks near the lake. The Delaware house was still in place at that time. It was in poor condition and he warned us not to go near it. We were also told to not go near the base where the missiles were housed during the Cold War. Not many people knew about its existence. Roads in the area around the lake were not paved. Not many signs were posted yet we felt lucky to have it near our homes. It is with good reason that swimming is not allowed at Wolf Lake on the Illinois side. In the late 1950s, early 1960s, my family along with others from the Arizona side of Hagwish often walked down the road from our homes and relaxed in the lake. Frequently my aunts, uncles, and cousins were with my parents, my sisters, and myself. On one occasion, one of my aunts with my sister on her shoulders was walking backward from the shore. 
Within a short distance, she and my sister were suddenly out of sight. She had stepped into a deep drop off. It wasn't long before she bobbed up, but my sister was still down in the water. My dad and all of my uncles were frantically diving in the water. Despite their efforts, they could not find her. After at least five minutes or longer, one of them got her untangled from the seaweed. And they call it seaweed, but we know that it's Eurasian milfoil. And um, it's, um, it's been treated and much of it has disappeared, but it's, it's still in the lake and uh, particularly uh, numerous on the Illinois side of Wolf Lake. Bob Brandeis was reminded that the watershed was in the midst of industry. Quote, in 1955, when there was an explosion at Standard Oil refinery, steel ended up in the south end of Wolf Lake, he recalls. It came crashing in after the tanks blew up. I think it was June of 55, maybe August. And I, I think it's more like July of 55. Does anybody here remember? It was, it was August. Yeah, or you it. just observed the anniversary the other day, yeah. Yeah, it oh. was the 27th, I believe. Right. Of, uh, uh, there was August. Just, of August. So oh. it was August, okay. A great, great DVD they put together. Pardon? They put a wonderful half-hour DVD together. Oh, oh, did they? Yeah, okay. and they're for sale at the Hysterical Society. Okay. Ah, okay. There were other explosions. One was at a plant on or near property that once housed ice mine from Wolf Lake. I would fish there, recalls Ed Smutniak, and there was a platform then, <coughs> just a platform, a firecracker place, a big one. Thurl and Duffield used to make firecrackers there. And three guys went in. Derek Burns, Goonie Acres, and someone else. And this guy had a cigar, lit it, and blew up, killed one of them. That was the big firecracker place. I assume there's better history of it than what Ed Smutniak remembers, but that's his version. Some childhood memories were of things bigger than life. One of the many things I remember about Wolf, Wolf Lake was how Big, I thought it was, writes Jean Azufleto. To this day, the lakes and the oceans I've seen don't stack up to how big I thought Wolf Lake was, particularly if you're in the middle of it in the winter and you hear the ice start to crack. I know what, he, what he's talking about. I think any of us that skated in, on rivers and lakes know what he's talking about. There were squatters. Camp Cook was an old guy from World War I. Is that how you pronounced it? Camp Cook? That name familiar to anybody? Uh, was an old guy from World War I. Uh, and, it's, it's act, and he had his eye shot out. And he lived as a hermit and he rented boats, 15 cents an hour. Mean guy, too. Right here, <laughs> off of Sheffield. Dead Dog Island? It was right where the pavilion is now by Wolf Lake. That was all swamp and the road and an, and an island. And there was a guy who lived there named Stack. He lived on that island. Then Irene Kanesh used to rent boats right where the channel is. I think she's talking about the Mason Channel. She was a squatter there that used to rent metal boats. Bob Brandeis grew up on Chicago's 134th Street, half a block from Wolf Lake during the 1950s and 1960s. I was a paper boy, he recalled, and I delivered papers to the Delaware House. I was 11 years old, and I delivered the Chicago American, which was an afternoon daily, and I had a rare experience of being inside the Delaware House. They left the door open for me to go into the library. Again, 11 years old, scariest thing in the world, this big building and there was nobody there. And there was this wall lined with books and such and a big table. I would find my two dollars or whatever it was and then whoever it was left me a cookie and a glass of milk. Wolf Lake hadn't been dredged yet, writes Betty Dilling. And I would hear some of the older children talk about how shallow Wolf Lake was and that one could walk across it. At about 12 years old, my friend and I decided to try it. 
to our amazement, it really was shallow, way out there. We were in junior high and fearless. I never would try anything like that now. When I was 10, we moved a block away because we needed more bedrooms, writes uh, Dilling. My parents rented the house out. After we got married, my husband and I bought the house from our parents. Our children grew up with Wolf Lake Adventures. Now our grandchildren come and enjoy the lake as I did so many years before. This has always been a little Shangri-La right here in the midst of industry. Frank and I are blessed with so many gorgeous sunsets and summer breezes. Marilyn Rousseau also spent her entire life near Wolf Lake. As time has gone on, Wolf Lake has flourished, she writes. Paved roads, many signs, boat launches, and a ranger station are now part of the park. Fishing, hunting, and even boating take place on the lake. It is now the home of the annual Wolf Run and many events for children and seniors. Every holiday and weekend during the summer months, families have picnics, reunions, and play games running and watching the wildlife, duck, beasts, numerous types of birds, and small mammals, and even deer. In the past couple of years, we have become alarmed at the destruction of many trees by the beavers in the park. However, pulling out our lawn chairs and sitting in the cool lake breezes is our favorite thing to do. Now, this is this kind of a, a sketch of uh, selected memories I chose, not um, necessary for the content, but because of the diversity of, of, um, of, of thoughts. Now, um, in the book, uh, in the history, in the manuscript, whatever you call it, I have um, another chapter, chapter 12, in which uh, when I was writing uh, the man manuscript, I was, uh, it was recommended that I include comments uh, from other people about um, uh, our work as an organization. And uh, uh, so in chapter 12, uh, Dr. Lynn Westfall uh, sent back a couple paragraphs. Uh, but it also included things that uh, included memories as well. So I thought I might add her comments also. I'll skip a portion of it. Uh, when the Association for the Wolf Lake Initiative formed, I remember thinking another organization. Kaimet doesn't need another organization. There were so many. A testament to the deep meaning and importance that the region held for local residents. I was skeptical about the need for another and whether it would last. And here we are over a decade later and Ali is alive and well, continuing with their wetland and winter festivals and advocacy for Wolf Lake, while still small. Ali has grown and professionalized. I was wrong. And I'll just skip down to the end. In between, it's a lot of uh, platitudes about Ali, but, uh, I, but we all know that, so I don't have to. One day in about 2003 or so, we were having a family brunch in our Evanston home. My partner was wearing the Wolf Lake t-shirt, you know, the one with the swans. My mother looked across the table, saw it, and exclaimed, Wolf Lake? My Wolf Lake? The one where my father took me fishing as a kid? Ollie started and continues his labor of love for the Wolf Lake and for the community at large. They have significant impact in advocating for the lake and keeping it in our minds and hearts, in keeping Wolf Lake, <coughs> my Wolf Lake, for all of us. So that was kind of neat. That was from uh, uh, Dr. Westfall of the U.S. Forest Service, who did uh, a series of studies at Wolf Lake. Um, and in fact, if you look at the, uh, the list of speakers this year, uh, many of them are not from, uh, do not live in the Cayman, but they came here uh, because their work brought them here. And um, so they, they have um, uh, contributions to make, uh, and I look forward to hearing from them. 
Um, I'm kind of tired of reading. Uh, so I was just wondering if there was uh, any uh, questions about what I covered. Um, uh, one of the things is, and I think uh, we discussed this previously at a, in, a, in a video taken by Kevin about Lee Botts's um, memory of that sign, uh, prohibiting radioactive material. And I could go over that if uh, I think we have time. And I'll kind of skip it, but uh, skip through it. But it is uh, such an in interesting story that, um, and a curious story, because for maybe 15 years, people would keep, would ask me about it. And since I really didn't grow up in the area, I, I didn't have an answer. And I said, yeah, yeah, some, somebody else has asked me about it. Uh, but in my manuscript, not only do we have a theory behind what it was, but we actually have a photo of it. And the, the photo reads, radioactive material prohibited unless unless by special permit. And I mean, if you saw that sign today, uh, people, but I, I, I had questions all the time. People I, I never knew, they just knew I was really had to, was doing something with Wolf Lake. And I want to use this because it, it includes some people that I know as well as uh, Lee Botts. And Lee Botts was editor of the Hyde Park Herald. Uh, I remember in the in the 60s and early 70s, and uh, uh, before she ended up uh, moving to Indiana. One of the mysteries in my life is whether I was actually told how radioactive waste came to be dumped into Wolf Lake. Behind this question was the mystery that my family pondered every time we crossed Wolf Lake on our way to the Indiana Dunes in the 1960s and 70s. Why was there a sign on the west side of the lake by I-90 that said, radioactive material prohibited unless by special permit? The ongoing mystery is whether Norman McLean, author of The River of the River Run Through It, really answered the questions in 1966. And I know uh, Norman because uh, I worked at the University of Chicago, and when he wrote this, uh, it was actually three uh, short stories in a book, um, and I was given the galley proofs, and I worked for the information uh, office there, uh, public relations office, and um, so I was trying to uh, promote his book. And uh, I wish I had kept the galley proofs because you don't have galley proofs anymore. Uh, uh, anyway, you, you can download them from here. Uh, but uh, I, said, I wish I had the galley proofs. You know what, excuse me, I have to say, what's so bizarre about that sign to me is like people driving by are going to dump radioactive material. I mean, who is that sign meant for? I'm going to tell you. The box is going to tell you. Okay. At the time, I was editor of the Hyde Park Herald, the weekly newspaper on the south side neighborhood where the University of Chicago was located. Sometime in the spring, I received a press release inviting me to attend an event in the Jones Chemistry Building on the university campus, commemorating the 25th anniversary of the, of the identification of plutonium as a primary element. At that event, I fell out of place among the many participants in the Manhattan Project, including such notables as Glenn Sieber and Enrico Fermi and somewhat squeamish about essentially commemorating the use of something so dangerous in the, as the 94th element in the periodic table of elements. But the atm atmosphere was more like a school reunion, with men all around me sharing stories of their roles in achieving the first nuclear fission that made possible development of the nuclear bombs during World War II. I wondered how they had felt about the possible exposure to radioactivity, even though I had read how the danger had not been fully understood even by scientists at that time. A few days later, I shared my feelings with McLean, a great storyteller with whom I had become friends through our mutual interest in planting trees in the city. I knew that he'd been 
on the university faculty during the war and knew many of the Manhattan Project legends on campus. Earlier he had told me how much he delighted in taking out-of-town visitors for a walk in the forest preserve near Argonne National Laboratory in Le Mans and showing them where waste from the project was buried. He smiled as he asked me whether I had ever noticed a strange warning sign near Wolf Lake and did I want to know why it was there? You're going to have to find out that. His, his story was that in 1945, as World War II was ending, scientists from several countries met in a room next to a laboratory in the Jones Building to decide who would do what kind of experiments to learn more about plutonium. A precious sample had been flown from the University of California at Berkeley, which at the time was the only cyclotron capable of separating it from uranium. Part of that story, uh, the part of the story that seems most doubtful to me is that the sample had to be left in the test tube in a sink in the chemistry laboratory next door during the discussion and that a janitor had come in and poured it down the drain. It just seems unlikely to me that a janitor, janitor would ever empty a test tube in a chemistry laboratory. But Norman said the, said the speculation about the possible consequences led to a decision to dig up the sewer line along 57th Street. That would be right in front of Ellis uh, uh, the yeah. Avenue yeah. building, the yeah. administration yeah. building there. And, uh, but Norman said this, uh, and uh, the waste, he said, had been uh, dumped into Wolf Lake. Sometime later, further consideration had led to informing local authorities about the mishap. The radioactive materials were retrieved again, he said, and this time encased in concrete and dumped into Lake Michigan. Idea. Someone, evidently Hammond authorities, then erected the puzzling sign. As my fa family said every time we went by, who would ever give a permit to dump radioactive waste in such a place anyway? In 1973, my 17-year-old daughter, Beth, I think you might read some of her columns in the Chicago Tribune. I think she still uh, writes for them. Uh, Beth needed a feature story idea for a journalism class at Columbia College she was taking while working as an editorial assistant at the Bolton of Atomic Scientists. Why don't we try to solve the mystery of the Wolf Lake sign, I said, and you might get a publishable story. Norman stuck by his story when we asked who might verify it and said he would find out whether his longtime friend Lawrence Compton would be willing to talk with Beth. Compton had been the business manager and top administrator for the Manhattan Project and successor to Robert Hutchinson as chancellor at the University of Chicago in the 1950s, but was living in retirement in Michigan in the 1970s. Compton was sick. Norman called to tell me, but would, but would uh, talk with Beth when, uh, when he recovered from an Ill illness, um, if we would go to Michigan. Alas, he died soon after. Norman McLean himself died several years later after he had moved from Hyde Park. Uh, still later, we do, do not know exactly when, the sign was removed. A photo of Beth standing beside it is the only evidence we have now that it existed. But when I told this story to a group during a recent tour of the Lake Calumet region, another participant told me that a neighbor who had died used to tell of having driven the truck that dumped the materials that caused the sign to be erected. We still speculate about the mystery behind the sign whenever we drive past the place where it stood. And that was, isn't that interesting? Um, where was the sign? Uh, it was uh, close to uh, I-90 from the uh, As you skyway. came up over the uh, causeway, you first come onto the causeway, it was down to the right on, on the uh, shoulder of the road. There was at least one. I, I'm not sure whether there was more than one. Oh. So it was as we were kind of entering. The, I used to teach at IUN and Gary at that yeah. time. Didn't know anything about the region at all. 
uh, to amount to anything. And I just came in from Oak Park and drove over, and that. And I kept thinking, like everybody else did, what do you mean permission? Yeah. You know, I, I can I can do this. All I have to do is get a permit. <laughs> what would I do? And they go the same kind of questions. I, I never had an answer until we had that moment with Lee Botson out in Wolf Lake Park. Yes. <laughs> As a matter of fact. Well, well and, even more, uh, more more strange is people don't drive around with radio reactive equipment. <laughs> Right. Sorry. Like, what, I mean, what, what, what are the exceptions here, and how did they happen? That's what I'd like to question. You have an old nuclear weapon you want to drop in the water? Yeah, that's what I mean. I think I'll just put yeah. it over here. Yeah. Yeah. Turned out it was a little bit, as Michael said, it was a little bit less dramatic than oh, that. Oh, yeah. But, but it, isn't it interesting that uh, people kept asking about it, and I kept, and finally, at this meeting at Wolf Lake, Lee Botts, you know, told the story. It's a very quirky story. And yeah, then, yeah. and then I said, and then she, so she mentioned she had a photo. So I said, okay. okay. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm writing a history of yeah. Wolf Lake, and I'd like to include that. Sure. Could you write it out for me? Mm -hmm. And uh, so she gave me. Um, I can't remember if she gave me the negatives or something. So I reprinted the. Oh, I don't know. There was about four or five different pictures. Okay. Was so, it her daughter or one of them? With the sign? Yeah, that was yeah. Beth. That was his, uh, her daughter. So, isn't that a neat story? Yeah. And, and <laughs> with McLean, he was living in, uh, when I knew him, he was living in Montana. And he would come in and teach maybe uh, uh, a quarter. And then he would teach one quarter a year. And he was, when he published that book, he was 70. And that was his first published work was a uh, river run through it. And, um, and, uh, and so that was neat. So her story has some connections yeah. for me too. So well, I remember uh, some of those people uh -huh. So um, I'm, not, I'm not going to talk anymore. Is, uh, are there other questions about uh, the memories? And in fact, what I'm plan on doing is that before anybody leaves, that, that uh, if anybody wants to contribute to chapter four of, uh, of um, Over the Line, is that the, yeah, the working title, I guess. The working title is Over the Line. Um, you're free to. And Tom, I, I know you know Wolf Lake better than I do, don't you? Me? Yeah. Uh, well, I. I I moved there in 1956, just a few tens of yards from the uh, from the shore. So I have and some you're memories. Out, and you're out there every day, not every day. But I yes, see. I am out there just about every day. I still live next to Yeah. I remember seeing I, from from the Indiana side. I remember seeing the the little white missiles yeah. <laughs> during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, okay. yeah. um, I have some memories from my mother who was 92 years old mm -hmm. and when I told her I'd be coming to the meeting tonight I told, I told her that I would be sharing these memories with everybody. Um, it's about the Eggers Grove picnics that she remembers um, that she attended as a teenager so that was probably in the 1930s or the 40s and um, she's trying to think of somebody else who could help her remember this. She yeah. says, but they're all dead. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this is as much as she can remember all by herself. Um, they used to be every Sunday in the summertime, and they were informal, they were open to everyone, and they were free. And she seems to remember that they were sponsored by different groups, maybe churches or different uh, community groups. There would often be live music, and sometimes there would be a Mexican band playing. She remembers the very lively music. Uh, there were food vendors. They would sell hot dogs and things. Um, there were picnic tables there for their use, and there was dancing. And she can't recall what kind of a dance floor was there. And I said, well, well, did you dance on the grass? She says, no, no. And I says, well, was it a parking lot? She says, no. But she doesn't remember. But um, she says mostly family groups would come, but the teenagers would come by themselves. She and her friends uh, would come after lunch. Uh, they didn't come for the food. They just wanted to be there for the music and the dancing. And she said they would walk to 112th Street and then take a path into the woods. And she says back then it was all dirt roads. There was uh, nothing was paved, and you had to walk through the prairies in order to get there. Um, she says Egress Grove was not as well manicured then as it is now. 
but uh, the kids would stay there and they would dance and she says every now and then the couples would sneak off into the woods for a little while and then come back. <laughs> and she and her friends uh, usually left by about 6.30, but she says the events would continue into the evening after that. So if anybody knows, I don't know if the Historical Society has any any information about picnics at Edgar's Grove in the summertime. I don't Grove. Really? Edgar's Grove was on Sheffield, uh, near the trailer, where the trailer parks are today. It was similar to Edgar's Grove. It was all fenced in, private parties and stuff. Uh -huh. yeah. they, they do have pictures I had my, from my mom, who was a classmate of one of the Vaders, uh -huh. who was one of the original German families that came uh -huh. in the 18. 90s, and the the uh, Eggers and the Vaders and the rest of them used to go camp along the channel oh. and spend the summers there. And it's just thing that thing you're talking about fishing and hunting and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There there is a story I remember where when Standard Oil was looking for a place to put up a refinery, they also looked at Wisconsin. They chose here. Is that's it's one thing I used to do with the school kids. It's one person, one decision had they decided to build a refinery in in Wisconsin, they'd be coming here to fish and hunt. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good stuff, all good stuff, all good stuff. Yeah. I remember, I remember uh, some members of the ice houses, and uh, there was a night, I, I think I had to be in high school, junior high school, I don't remember, and we skated over to Douglas Park across Wolf Lake to get to Douglas Park. Yeah. And there was a bunch of girls there, so we stayed longer than we should. And all my friends were gone, and I skated back in the dark from Douglas Park along the little more like so across the flake. And it was that's when I verified the fact that God is in my life all the freaking time. Because <laughs> <laughs> the eyes were just cracking everywhere. Yeah. And I just kept going and made it home. And it, it scares you because you would know, well, it's not really, it's just cracking, you know. It's, it but it that. still scared you, no matter you know how, how you, you knew that it wasn't really. But it, I used to skate on the river, and I used to skate. Uh, this is in Eastern Nile, and I would. My grandmother lived in a small town, four miles um, up the river, mm -hmm. so we would skate up there, and then walk to our house in our stocking feet, get hot chocolate, and colaches. Yeah. So but in the in the fifties, it was okay. Pete Schmidt and his brother-in-law Jimmy Land who opened up Maryland, where the uh, parking lot is now, uh, where Phil Schmidt's had their first uh, little hut. Oh, okay. And I knew my dad used to get boat rides from there, down the channel and around the island and back. So I was there every day, and I worked there. And I think it was the WGN TV uh, characters would come out: Uncle Johnny Coons and Tutan Baker and. Those kind of people. It was like a mini Saucers. It wasn't anywhere as big as that. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. That's right along Indianapolis Boulevard. Yes. Yeah. It would have been, uh, well, were they, I think it's a Lieber Brothers parking lot yeah. there now. Yeah. 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 It was right there. Right it was right there. there. Yeah. yeah. And I also, also, there was a uh, uh, Midway. The, so, the, big, the big roller coaster? Roller coaster. Yeah, I got a picture of that. That was on the other. That was on Lieber Brothers' property. Yeah. Right. It was massive, massive. Yeah, and I've seen photographs of that, too. Yeah, and that was uh, before there were seat belts and things. My dad said people would stand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Their heads knocked off going down to <laughs> yeah. Roby, And there's a lot of stories about Roby Raceway, Racetrack. Yep. And the and um, story behind that. Before the FBI, when the uh, gangsters would come across, and. Uh, I know they moved it was later, it was probably in the 60s, because downtown Robertsdale pretty much shut down in the uh, late 50s, early 60s when Jewel opened up for a supermarket, yeah. so that destroyed that. But there was a group of Chicago guys, Italians, that used to play cards at uh, Margaret's upstairs. And the FBI got to them, so they came, and our store was vacant then, and we had, we had the soda fountain and everything, and in the back it was this morning because it was level. But they rented it from my dad to play cards. And it just amazed me that all these fancy cars with all my plates parked there on the weekends, yeah. and the cops never questioned anything. <laughs> they were very nice guys, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, is that the Columbian Exposition of 1893? 1893. 
Because yeah. that had a big impact on this area. Because uh, one, uh, cops chased the mob out of Chicago, and they ended up in Whiting at Roby. And yeah. then the Delaware House was moved after the fair, after, was moved from there to Hegwish. Um, and Pardon? Physically moved? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And the story is that, that they just put it on a, uh, <coughs> on a uh, raft or a boat or something like that? Barge. Barge? Barge. And, uh, like those ones in the dunes that came from there. Pardon? The homes in the dunes that came from the... From oh, the oh, is that right? Yes. Yeah, Five and or you, six of them yeah. have survived over there, yeah. Yeah, they give tours, I think they just... They're probably just giving tours again now if they haven't already done it. But it's, they're fascinating to go through, and their histories. And the, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I've heard that. I haven't ever been on the tour or seen what I've read about. Yeah. What was the Delaware House? I, I haven't heard of it. It was, well, during the exposition, they had invited states to, uh, to uh, build a home. Oh, so that was a that model home, a Delaware model. So this is a model home for, for the state of Delaware. Yeah, and some of them they just burned down at the end of the fair, and, and uh, but apparently this one was sold, and so this Canadian trapper uh, uh, bought it, had it shipped by barge to uh, the shoreline of Avenue K Channel, which was public property, but he didn't care, so he, he set up the, his house there. And uh, there are stories, and I don't know how true they are, of the sheriff trying to get taxes from his house, and, and I don't think they ever could. And uh, he had uh, five or six wives, uh, I think mostly all Native American. And um, and so the Delaware House was... Michael or what? Pardon? All at once, five or six wives? Oh, yeah. And not only that, he shared them with with visitors to the house on the weekend, okay. and these are for... Sounds like some other kind of a place to me. Yes. <laughs> and, and, well, that's what, what I hear. But they, they were all hunters, so they, uh, and, and politicians and, and all sorts of things. So it was at least... Uh, and Bob, if, if Rod Sellers was here, he could expand upon that more, more than I can. But he and I pretty much agree with what... Was that the origin of the share of the wealth concept? <laughs> there you go. I remember uh, hearing a rumor when I was a kid that, that Lincoln used to make it, but it would yeah. vacation out here. And and that was a rumor, and it, it was not true. I, so. I just got a call. In fact, Rod Sellers and I both get calls on it. I got a call from WTTW about six months ago. And it was in the paper. And, and there was an article in the paper about it. Okay. Really, times. Okay, was there? Read and, and of course it's not true and and everybody keeps saying it's true and and the uh, the book that I relied on a lot on the Indiana side had that in the book oh, really? but I knew that it was not true so I, I didn't want to repeat it Rod Sellers was the first one to tell me you know that's not true yeah it seems and, unlikely uh, to me though. well there was an article in the daily paper then that they used to walk down from the railroad yeah. And the only reason it became a story because one of his kids almost drowned and they had to call for help. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the story. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, yeah. 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 I don't know. It's like Octave Chanute landing in Goose Island. You know. yeah. <laughs> Who knows? You know. But it's, anyways, that's been pretty well documented that, that it's uh, false. So I, so I told the guy from, <laughs> from Channel 11, I said, nice story. Yeah. But it's not true. <laughs> I mean, we have two videos going around in the region right now fairly recent and, and you know one of them has to do with the heritage court and that and they're talking about the 300,000 people that worked at U.S. Steel well if 20,000 was their you know 20, 22,000 was their peak if they're saying 300,000 over a period of 50 years maybe but it comes across in the video is man that place was housing three shifts and 300,000 people 20,000 at the most yeah. uh, okay. U.S. Steel and Gary is 30 some thousand 
now it's by far the largest. But it's, it's on video now. We're stuck with it. Uh, you can't believe it. It's just going around. It's video. By, uh, by uh, uh, which one? Joanne, we just saw it. It was... Uh, I think Claritian. Was it the Heritage one or the Claritian one? I think it was Claritian. Okay, yeah, Claritian. it was a, an, an error, a typo, one additional zero. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're right. About that. Yeah, and yeah. At, at the most it was 20. And I think, yeah, 20 and something. It's still a lot. And, yeah, it was still a lot. I just, yeah. yeah. Let me share real quick. Okay. okay. It's, it's, it's more contemporary. Uh, when we started our environmental school at Bowen, uh, we got most of the kids who were really in need of uh, kind of a small school concept that we had. And uh, during one of your winter fests, okay. they were invited along with everybody else to go out on the ice. Yes. And these kids are looking at around like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody else should go out there first. And someone did go out and they tested it and it was thick enough to go out. So, and there were, there were only four of us, or four of the kids with us at that time. But what was unique about this is that one was born in Ghana. The other one, or well, one of the others, was Puerto Rican, and we probably had just a regular African American kid, and then there was another girl, and I don't remember what she was, but it was really mixed. And I have this photo, once they got used to the idea that the ice was not going to mm -hmm. disappear under their feet, they were having such a marvelous time. Mm -hmm. And we have this photo of just sheer delight on their faces. Yeah. So we thank you for that. that was <laughs> You know, that, that's one of the stories I like to tell. Because there, were, there was about 70 kids, high school kids, out that, that day. I mean, that was really a, a nice uh, uh, event. And, um, and getting, and it, it's a nice story because the, uh, the, uh, the speaker, we had a speaker there that I wanted to have him talk about ice fishing. And uh, so he, started into um, his talk and about five minutes into it he stops and he looks around at about 80 90 people in the room and he said but mostly kid and he looked at him and said okay he says how many of you have been on ice before and can you imagine people these were neighborhood kids yeah. and one or two hands and so he says, well, let's stop talking about ice fishing and let's stop talking about ice. And then he went on to talk about uh, the day that he and his son uh, had both fallen through the ice and their experience in surviving it. And, um, and it was a kind of a very touching story. Huh? And this was coming out. And, I think that every, all the kids were just, you know, really listening to it. it was and, and then he started talking about how you, about ice safety. And um, so, uh, and then, so he said, okay. And then after the talk, he said, we're all going to go out, and we're going to go out, and we're going to walk on the ice. But okay. first, we're going to test how thick the ice is. How that is. It, that was a cold winter, and that the, the ice that day was eight inches thick at least, where where he tested. And of course, one inch of ice is probably pretty safe, but eight inches, could, uh, nobody was going to fall through. So, uh, so he got him out into uh, two feet of water, three feet of water, four feet of water, and then out to the middle of the channel, which was probably eight feet deep um, and uh, and so then they, they there was a, a hockey rink and so and snowballs and and everybody was just having a great time and unfortunately there was one or two that never went out they were so afraid of ice that they stayed inside but when you have about 70 high school kids out there um, and your four were out there, and there was a group from um, uh, the north side of Chicago uh, what, um, who taught with you at uh, uh, Bob? 
Bill Smith. Oh, yeah. He had his kids from uh, uh, the ag school? They went from the ag school. He had a, a, a program that drew kids from all parts of Chicago. And he was teaching at the um, museum, at the zoo. Oh, okay. Lincoln Park, someplace in, I think in, on, at the zoo, a uh, building at the zoo. And it was his kids that came down. But anyway, that was that was uh, a wild group, and that was a wild day. But that was, um, <laughs> and I kind of, that was the year that I really learned what uh, urban kids, what experiences they had and didn't have. Because I had, and Rod Sellers was involved in that, and, and he, one year he came up, that, maybe that uh, summer, we had a wetlands festival, and he had 10 kids from um, uh, the east side, George Washington High School, came out, and they were going to help me with the festival. And so I was going to assign someone uh, to help with the canoes, help launch the canoes. So there was 10 of them standing there, and I said, okay, I said, who's Who's been in a canoe? How many? Nobody raised their hand. And I looked at him and I said, how are you supposed to help me with a canoe riding? Nobody has been in a canoe. But I had an instructor there and uh, who turned out to be a really good instructor. So I said, okay. I said, tomorrow somebody asks you if, if you've ever been in a canoe, you'll be able to answer yes, because I want every one of you to take a ride in a canoe uh, before you leave that day. So they were assigned to other duties, but every one of them got into a canoe. And the, and the instructor was really good. He was he was great. And so they all had their first canoe ride. But that's urban kids. And that yeah. and so early on, I, I was the learning lesson for me, because I grew up in kind of a rural area. And I did all the things that uh, these folks did. And um, except I think there was, at one time I was going to, uh, there was a longest entry and a, and the shortest entry. And the longest entry, of course, is, is Bots, sorry. But the shortest memory is a uh, phrase uh, about, uh, oh, about, uh, as a teenager, about making out. And then she says, sort of. <laughs> so anyway, the memories of Wolf Lake, uh, I guess that's the extreme. Uh, sort of making out and um, and dropping radioactive materials. Has anybody ever mentioned auto races on the ice? Um, I have one in here uh, that would take his girlfriend out, and they would spin, do this. Well, there was Spinner probably a, a, maybe a short period of time, maybe it was just one winter, and they actually had, had I think they organized races in an oval just just off the, uh, the northern shore. Okay. Uh, you know, right next to Calumet Avenue. Yeah. And huh. and there were regular motorcycle races. Whoa. Is that? <laughs> yeah, that was where they, wasn't that the speedway? This was on the ice. Yeah. But this was on the air. Okay. I remember uh, in the 60s, it was in high school, with Jim Price, his parents owned the local record store. He had, uh, his mother had a Volkswagen. And before he went out there, we drilled down, and like, it was, the ice was a foot thick. Yeah. They went out there with the Volkswagen and <laughs> spinning around and stuff. And you could get tires then, or things to add to the tires to drive on the ice. Yeah. So you wouldn't just slide. <laughs> well, the, the raceway. Wasn't that built for both boats and cars? And I would assume that the, the section that was built for boats would freeze over the winter. And, and might be good for, that might be part of it. But that, that would have been in the 40s? Well, um, I, were, I saw okay. uh, car races and motorcycle okay. races okay. sometime after 1956. After, yeah, okay. I kind of remember that too. Uh, my older brothers and sister talked about um, ice boating on Wolf Lake when they were kids, and that was D Depression era. Big time. Yeah, they 
Yeah. Later than that, too. Well, that was what they were familiar with. And then the war right. happened, and right. they were all gone. So. Right. But yeah. there were boats when I was a kid. But yeah. there's still I, there's still us. I mean, not as many as there used to be. Hell, no. But Daberton had one. In fact, our, for our winter fest, we often have ice boats there. Yeah. And uh, the commodore of the Eliana Yacht Club, the previous one, used to uh, give up give a talk. And then one year, Dave Dabson showed up, and he, he was offering to go out. Uh, on the lake and take people out. And the only problem with that, it was that day it was five above. Uh, the previous day it was probably about 40 above. No. So the, uh, the ice wasn't really thick enough to go ice boating. But uh, because he went out and discovered there was some open ice and so he decided not to go. But that's five above. I would, even if there was plenty of ice, I mean, that's going 40, 50 miles an hour. Uh, and five above, you know. Um, and, uh, so, what are you doing when you're young? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the date never wasn't young. And I, and you do go out there in the winter time. I mm -hmm. haven't in a couple of years, but I would go out and see them ice boating, and there would there would be open water, and and I don't know who those people were, but uh, Eskimos. They <laughs> they survived. <laughs> Um, so, any announcement? Any other announcements? We had. We started out the, the night with announcements. There was anything that uh, come up? Feel free to say. And or and otherwise, I'm ready to go home. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you.